So after graduating from DLI, they shipped us off to Fort Meade, Maryland, which is home to the National Security Agency. And the NSA took us and put us into jobs where they needed our skills. Mm -hmm. What we would do is we would take either written or uh, spoken material in Russian and translate it into English for them to then use for intelligence purposes, which helped their forward deployed unit. You're listening to Speaking of Language, a podcast recorded at the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. Each week, we explore a topic related to language pedagogy and second language acquisition. This week on Speaking of Language. Cornell graduate student Alyssa Ford reflects on her time translating Russian for the United States Navy. We're back for a new episode of Speaking of Language. I'm Angelica Kramer, the director of the Language Resource Center at Cornell University. And I'm Sam Lupowitz, the LRC's Media Development Manager. We are joined today by Alyssa Ford, a student at Cornell's S.C. Johnson Graduate School of Management. Before arriving at Cornell, Alyssa was a linguist for the United States Navy and spent time in their intensive language school as well as working with civilian language analysts in the NSA. Welcome to Speaking of Language, Alyssa. Thank you. It's such an honor to be here. We are looking forward to learning more from you about all the things that you've been doing in your past and how you ended up at Cornell. So can you start out by telling us what is your background with languages? What languages have you learned? What languages do you speak? Um, and how did you go about learning them? Sure. So I've had a lifelong love of languages. When I was in middle school, I actually attended a Korean Baptist church. Oh, wow. Where I tried to learn a little bit of Korean uh -huh. while I was there because all of the sermons were in Korean, uh -huh. not in English. So <laughs> yeah. that made it more interesting. And then when I went to college, I learned Japanese for a year, which is really what sparked my interest in learning languages mm. academically. Mm -hmm. And then after a year there, I realized, wow, I could do this as a profession. Huh. That would be really cool. Yeah. And so I learned that the Navy had a linguist program. And so I signed up, not knowing what language I was going to be taught. Mm -hmm. uh, because before joining the mm -hmm. Navy, I did not know any languages at a professional level. Okay. And so I entered and they said, all right, we'll take you from zero to proficient. All right. Well, and that sounds serious. <laughs> <laughs> it was pretty serious. It was, uh, like you had mentioned, I had gone to the Defense Language Institute, which is the military's center for teaching mm -hmm. languages, and they taught me Russian in 47 weeks. Wow. And you went from zero to proficient? Yes. In all skill areas, in speaking, listening, reading, and writing? Or just in speaking and listening? or They primarily test in reading and listening. Mm -hmm. uh, they also test in speaking, and so I passed in all of the areas. Wow. That's amazing. Are you still using your Russian? Not as much as I had been, which okay. has been a, a real disappointment. Uh -huh. I'm hoping to get more into it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So was Russian the only language that you learned at the DLI, or were there different assignments that you that you had? That was the only language that I learned, okay. but there are other military linguists who are learning a bunch of other languages as well. Mm -hmm. So what is that, I mean, going from zero to proficient in 47 weeks, what does that look like? What was your, tell us a little bit about your time there and what that experience was. Of course. So essentially our day-to-day -day experience was seven hours in the classroom. Wow. We had three <laughs> hours in the morning, a lunch break, three hours in the afternoon, and then an hour of one-on-one -on -one time with the professors. Oh, wow. Um, so obviously that's a very exhausting schedule. So we had a team of teachers. Mm -hmm. So there was a group of uh, five teachers for about, I think, 18 students. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so they would also offer one-on-one -on -one speaking classes in the evening hours for students who were hmm. exceptionally interested in perfecting their speaking skills. Wow. And this is Monday through Friday or Monday through Sunday? Monday through Friday. Okay, they did so give us a little bit to, of a okay. break, <laughs> yeah. but that was so they could pile on the five hours of homework. Uh -huh. uh, <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, yeah, I mean, immersive environments, which I mean, it's not a fully immersive environment because you're not in the um, target country. But I mean, seven hours a day, that's that's quite a lot. And that's yeah, that's the way to do it. That's amazing. Um, so after you were done how did you apply the language that you that you learned? What did you do with Russian? So after graduating from DLI, they shipped us off to Fort Meade, Maryland, which is home to the National Security Agency. 
And the NSA took us and put us into jobs where they needed our skills. Mm -hmm. What we would do is we would take either written or uh, spoken material in Russian and translate it into English for them Mm -hmm. to then use for intelligence purposes, which helped their forward deployed units. Sure. Yeah. Was there ever a time when you had to interpret or like translate on the spot or was it mostly um, material that was given to you and you had more time to work on on the translations? I would say it was a little bit of a mix. Most of the material that we were working on was time sensitive. Mm -hmm. So we would get it in either near real time or soon after Mm -hmm. real time. Mm -hmm. And they would need a quick, a pretty quick turnaround on it, at least within a couple hours, 12 hours at the most. Mm -hmm. When you worked on those translations, did you do that by yourself? Or was there a team of translators that you collaborated with? I would say it was a little a bit of a mix of both. Mm-hmm. Everyone would have their individual assignments, but we did work in broader teams. So if you had any questions on your individual assignments, you could reach out to people who had been there longer, sure. who knew a little bit more, or maybe they could understand something that you weren't getting at the time. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So how long did you do that work for? For about five years. Wow. That's amazing. That's very fascinating. Did you enjoy what you were doing? I did. It was really exciting, partly because most of the language work was done by, in my shop at least, Navy linguists. Mm -hmm. But we also worked with civilian language analysts who had been there for 20 or 30 years. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so working with people who had that much experience was always a total joy. Mm -hmm. I think one of the linguists that I had talked with was like, oh, yeah, you know, I worked here before we had digital audio. So we would have (laughs) to reel out (laughs) the big... (laughs) Like the big actual, uh, the tape recorders. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. (laughs) They had some pictures from that time, too, and I can only imagine. Yeah. Wow, that's crazy. Has there been a specific instance um, where your skill set or what you have learned um, just by way of being a translator has been helpful after your um, time in the Navy or at the NSA? Not as much as I would have liked. I'd say uh, more interesting than useful is Mm -hmm. when I'm at the shopping mall and I can tell that there are people who speak Russian behind me and they're speaking in their native language. I like to eavesdrop and hear what they're talking about in the shopping center. Uh, (laughs) For our fall break, I'm going to New York City for the first time ever. Uh, And one of my friends wants to take me to Brighton Beach, which is the very heavily Russian populated part of New York City. Uh So I imagine it will come Greatly in handy there. (laughs) And I'm sorry if you said this. Where are you from originally? I grew up in southern Illinois. Okay. uh, So right outside of St. Louis, Missouri. Gotcha. How big was the team of translators at the NSA? I mean, you said that sometimes you worked with civilians, but you also had a lot of colleagues. How many people in the Russian section? So I actually don't know because the Russian section is split up into a bunch of different buildings and subsectioned off. I worked with about 80 Navy people, okay. and wow. they did a bunch of, mm-hmm. worked in different areas, mm-hmm. doing a little bit different things. Mm-hmm. Uh, but as far as everybody combined, I'm yeah. actually not certain. Yeah. yeah, those are dimensions I can't even, I can't even imagine. That's, that's wild. I would say one of the reasons why they required such a large Navy personnel presence is because we manned a 24-7 watch floor. Mm. And so it's very human capital intensive mm. to keep people at work for 24 hours a day. Yeah. Obviously, no single person works for 24 <laughs> hours, but sure, sure, yeah. you do need manpower to make sure all of the course. jobs are filled. Yeah, that yeah. makes sense. What are some of your major takeaways or lessons um, that you have learned just by going through this intensive language experience and by working as a translator? I think one of the ones that might be most applicable for our student body is that I learned that test grades don't actually convey how Mm -hmm. accurate you are Mm -hmm. as a linguist. And I say that because the military uses a standardized test to test how proficient you are in your language. Mm -hmm. It's a two-part test. Each part is three hours long, so it's a total of a six-hour long exam. And for the longest time, I struggled to score at, like, the next highest level to say that I was professionally Mm -hmm. proficient. Mm -hmm. I was business-level proficient, but not professional. But in my day-to-day work, I was always the go-to person Hmm. for translations. I was the one who understood the grammar the best. Mm -hmm. I knew 
what the hard words were. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And yet that didn't reflect the reality of what the test was showing. Mm. And so for me, it was really hard thinking or looking at my scores and saying, oh, sure. I'm not a very good linguist. But in the work application, I was one of the best linguists. Yeah. So I think it's important to realize that your grades don't define you. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I'm actually really glad that you're mentioning that because oftentimes I think we get so hung up on assessment as part of all the teaching that's happening. And we tend to forget that it's really being able to apply what we are learning in, in everyday context that, that should be more important. And whether or not you make little mistakes in conversation I mean, in day-to-day -day conversation, as long as communication doesn't break down, I think our students can be successful, regardless of if they have all their adjective endings right. <laughs> That's such a great point. <laughs> and this is actually going to be um, a nice segue into our next episode, too, where we talk about uh, language assessment literacy. So uh, people should stay tuned for that next episode. Perfect. But we're not quite we're not done yet, yet. <laughs> with, yeah, with you, Alyssa. We have so many more questions. All right. So so now you're a student here at Cornell at the Johnson School. Um, what brought you here what, when you transitioned out of working for the Navy as a linguist? What, what brought you to Cornell? Primarily was because I needed a change of scenery. Mm -hmm. While I really loved being a Russian linguist, the only place I can be a Russian linguist is in the Maryland, D.C. area. Mm -hmm. And my husband and I don't want to raise a family in that area, mm -hmm. so we are looking to go back to the New York, Boston area. Um, and so we realized that a perfect transition would be to go back to business school, gotcha. learn some new skills, mm -hmm. do something a little different. Um, my husband has always had a passion for finance, so mm -hmm. he was really motivated to go to business school. I've been interested in general management and marketing, so I'm very excited to see where that path takes me. Mm -hmm. Cool. So did you meet your husband in the Navy then? Is he also? I did. Okay. He is also a Russian linguist. Okay. But he did not enjoy the Russian part of the language, the analyst work. Mm -hmm. Uh-huh. He did more analyzing and less Russian. Okay. Got gotcha. it. <laughs> wow. But that's just so interesting to me. A colleague of mine, he I worked with him at Michigan State for a long time. And then he went into the Foreign Service. Just hearing him talk about, like, getting from zero to mm -hmm. uh, to proficient in like that it's it's so fascinating actually at dli we had one of the classes because it was split up into four little classes that all the teachers kind of taught around we mm -hmm. all did things together one of our sections was a foreign affair like a, the fao's the mm, foreign affairs okay. officers who their classes were even more even faster than ours mm -hmm. they learned russian i think in 36 weeks oh my goodness so they cut them off and they were like all right you guys are really gonna yeah. yeah when i think for them speaking is probably more um at the forefront than maybe reading because i mean i know that he was for a long time he did um like visa applications or something so mm -hmm. he, he was actually communicating with with people right there at the embassy or wherever you do that, probably embassy. Sounds right. Right. <laughs> um, yeah, but that's it's it's so interesting. I mean, and it's such. We actually had another podcast episode with a colleague who is looking at all these. Um, how long does it take to become proficient? Right, and all that work comes out of the DLI, and she is taking a a critical research approach to that because actually we've been unable to replicate these studies because how we research, you know, how long does it take to become proficient, things are, are done a little bit differently now, I guess, in, in uh, that research area. Um, and it's just such a different group of people, right? I mean, the motivation is, you can't compare that to a high school classroom or even oh, a yeah. college classroom. I mean, people have specific... Well, I think it's both intrinsic and extrinsic motivation, right? I mean, they, they know I need to do this or I can't work, right? Or I'm going to go be a deck seaman, which uh. is the threat for us, <laughs> uh -huh. which is the person on the boat or like on oh, the big yeah. Navy ships chip and paint. Oh, my goodness. So wow. So it's like I could either learn this language and have yeah. a much nicer job or I could be deployed oh, out with the aircraft carrier, chipping paint and repainting it 
Wow. Over and over again. Oh my goodness! Yeah, no, I wouldn't want to do that either. <laughs> yeah, I get seasick. Apart from that, that would not be a good position for me. But you were, you were never actually, were you like deployed like out on the sea? I was not. Okay. Uh, so I was shoreside the entire time. But I do have friends who deploy on submarines, mm -hmm, on, mm -hmm. not very often on the surface vessels because mm -hmm. they're not as required. But submarines and an aircraft. Okay. So what are your plans for the future? Do you think there might still be a place for a language in there? Do you see any chance to utilize the Russian skills that you have or maybe pick up another language? Absolutely. So even though business relations with Russia are not the best at the moment, mm -hmm. I know that they are still a big business partner for several large corporations. Yeah. And so I'm very excited to use my language skills to work with those companies and maybe expand their business operations in Russia. And then also I do really love languages, so I would love to learn additional languages mm -hmm. in the future as well. Mm -hmm. If there was one piece of advice that you would give to students who are interested in pursuing um, a future in languages, maybe working um, for the Navy or working as a translator, what would be that advice? So I think for anybody who would be interested in working as a language analyst for NSA specifically, to be sure to apply to their internship mm. because they have summer language analyst opportunities. And that is a great way to, one, get your clearance kind of started already, and then also to get some great experience to figure out if that's a position you're actually interested in. Mm -hmm. And even if it's not, then you'll have a great time sure. kind of seeing what national security is about, getting, a, getting your feet wet in the language from that perspective yeah wonderful great All for right. the navy you just have to show up to a recruiting station <laughs> <laughs> yes <laughs> well uh before we sign off we'd like to ask you to share your favorite word in a language you speak or have learned or are learning or want to learn so let's hear it all right i have two yes okay. one is one that i've made up oh great. Um, <laughs> i love it for russian makes a lot of sense and that one is a koshkamyot which is a cat launcher All right. That's awesome. This is, yes, a, a device that we could debate the use of, yes, you and I, yes. what, how, uh, its practical application. <laughs> and then a more serious, realistic one is uh, Sputnik. Mm. And one of the reasons why I love that one is because in most contexts it means satellite, but because of how you can break up the word, it also means like a co-traveler, mm. someone oh. who goes with you along the way. Oh, that's great. And I just great. love... Huh. I love the prefixes and suffixes and how yeah, yeah. if you know the roots of the word, you can figure out what it means, even mm -hmm. if you don't actually know what the context okay. is. Huh. Terrific. That's great. Always learn so many new things on this podcast. Great. Yeah. Is there anything that, that if we asked you, you'd, you'd say, I could tell you, but I'd have to kill you? <laughs> oh, there definitely are. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> that was my last question. <laughs> nice. Well, I'm, I'm glad you were able to ask that. Good, good. <laughs> Excellent. <laughs> We really appreciate you speaking of language with us today, Alyssa. Thank you. It's been a real pleasure. Next week, Margaret Malone will join us in the studio. Dr. Malone wears many hats. She is director of the Assessment and Evaluation Language Resource Center at Georgetown University, a research professor at Georgetown, and she is also the director of ACTFL Center for Assessment Research and Development. She will be on campus as part of our monthly LRC speaker series, giving a talk titled, What do students and instructors need to understand about language assessment? And what do language assessment developers and researchers need to know about students and instructors? We will extend our conversations about language assessment literacy with her on next week's episode. Until then... Auf Wiederhören! The Language Resource Center is located on the ground floor of Stimson Hall on Cornell's main campus in Ithaca, New York. Check us out on the web at lrc.cornell.edu or look for Cornell LRC on Facebook and Twitter. Speaking of Language is produced by Angelica Kramer and Sam Lupowitz. Recorded by Sam Lupowitz. Original music by Sam Lupowitz, Dan Gable, and Joe Gibson. Thanks also to the College of Arts and Sciences at Cornell University. As a reminder, the ideas and opinions expressed on this podcast do not reflect those of the College of Arts and Sciences or any other official entity of Cornell University. We thank our listeners, and do stay tuned for our next episode.